to the Unleash Success Podcast, where we break down the secrets of success to give you real tools and strategies that get real results. And now, here's your host, Corey Korpodian. Uh, welcome back to Unleash Success. Today, we interview a very special guest who's a entrepreneur, mentor, artist, and one of the co-founders of Volcom. Volcom is a modern lifestyle brand that really embodies the spirit of the youth culture, where it went public in 2005 and then in 2011 it was sold to the Caring Group for over $600 million. It is widely recognized by the trademark stone logo that we have here in the background. Um, and that logo was in fact created by our guest. And thank you very much for joining us today, Mr. Tom McElroy. Hello. Hello. I'm glad to be here. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And just for our audience, I kind of want to go back into your story of where this entrepreneurial journey for you really began. Well, I think it began when um, I f picked up my first sponsorship uh, through surfing. I was uh, 14 years old and it kind of catapulted me into you know, the business world of something I was super passionate about, which was surfing. Um, I worked with some great uh, business owners saying Jack O'Neill, uh, Bob Hurley, who was running Billabong, who eventually started his own line Hurley that he sold to Nike. Um, but I was exposed to a lot of movers and shakers that were super passionate about the sport they loved and they, they, learned, they learned how to make money doing what they love doing best. So it's a I, talent in itself, right? <laughs> yeah, it started early. And um, as I as I grew older, I was exposed to higher levels within these companies. And um, and eventually they all became my friends. And if I didn't surf against them growing up, um, I met them later on. And uh, it was just kind of like a giant fraternity that uh, we were able to push the limits in action sports and and. Uh, do some great things and, and really live the lifestyle that we love. That's amazing. Being able to turn your passion into something that actually makes money and supports you is, is a huge uh, lifestyle step and something that, especially in the millennial generation, a lot of people are really trying to do and some people have become very successful. Um, and this is, you know, years ago with Volcom, which is obviously the iconic brand. I mean, I grew up wearing it and I, like I was saying earlier, I still have a sweatshirt, mm. shorts, everything, right? Mm. Um, so, you go. You went to college at SDSU, and uh, you're going through college. Did you start off as a business major? Or? Yeah, um, it's funny. I, uh, my dad, you know, when I was starting college, um, I first had to decide if I was going to serve professionally or actually go to school. So I started off at Orange Coast College here in Orange County, and I was there for two years as a business major. But I was always taking art classes on the side. And one day, one of my professors pulled me over to his desk and he said, he's like, so what's your major? And I said, ah, oh, it's business administration. He's like, why? And I go, well, my dad really wants me to, to do that. And I, he's like, oh, so you're going to live your dad's life? And I'm like, oh, my God, what? Whoa, whoa, whoa. My dad, you know, ex-LAPD, mom's a nurse. I was a Catholic family, super conservative. There's no way I can change my major. So I started thinking about it. I had a philosophy class in that semester too, and it was that was really engaging, and it was kind of pushing my buttons on how I should expand as an individual. And one day I just said, you know what? I'm going to change my major to art. This is what I'm super passionate about. I love drawing. I love graphic design, um, and I just love the whole vibe. Business was very interesting to me, the mechanics of it, the systems of it, but to actually make that as a major was super boring to me. So I, you know, my dad came home from, drove down from LA. We were living in Huntington Beach at the time. And they said, hey dad, I'm changing my major. He's like, oh, to what, finance? <laughs> what are you doing, accounting? Where, where are you going? I go, to art. He goes, there's no way that I'm gonna support that. He goes, you're gonna be penniless and living in the streets. And a couple other things he said that I can't bring up. But I'm like, Dad, you just got to believe in me. And um, so he fought it. And, you know, now he's one of my biggest cheerleaders. But, um, yeah, that was a, one of my first exercises of 
going against parental, you know, that dictatorship. Yeah, no. And a lot of people always get stuck in what they think their their parents want them to do, what mm. society wants them to do, what they think they should do, mm. as opposed to pursuing what they really want to do. So in your head, how did you believe in yourself enough to stand up to your dad and step out of that and say, I'm going to actually do this? Well, I think what it was, I had a lot of success in surfing and competing. And, you know, I felt that, you know, I was one of the best amateur surfers. I had that confidence. I, I learned how to compete. I learned how to search and destroy. So to me, it was like it was a barrier, but it was a barrier that I was going to go through. Regardless of what he said, I was going to go through, through kind of his, I go back to the dictatorship. Um, but I just, I just had the confidence. I believed in myself. I, I always kind of had that growing up and, um, and it just, it helped me, you know, it, it has always helped me through my business career. Yeah. Excellent. So you're, you decide to pursue art mm -hmm. and how does that go? Uh, it was great. It, I couldn't believe that it was my major. I would show up every day. I was painting, drawing, graphic design, art history. I love art history. I love architecture, you know, studying everything that I love. And I would meet with with other students that were business majors or whatever. And I'm just going, God, poor guys, you guys have to go to the library. <laughs> I go to the studio and I draw and I'm in, I was a printmaking minor and I got to learn how to serigraph and, and intaglio and, and I, all these like great, you know, art mediums. I've, they had everything. It was in San Diego State it was an up and coming art school at the, at the time. And it was just a great place. I had great professors. Um, and it wasn't, it was like, I was cheating and it was so easy and I was so passionate about it. And I couldn't believe that, that I questioned myself maybe a little bit in the beginning, just being a business major. I'm curious, uh, just wrap this up, but when you question yourself, and, cause you know, I sometimes question myself, even when I'm doing something new, anytime you're outside your comfort zone, you're questioning, ah, should I really do this mm -hmm. or am I really meant to do this? Or should I just stay within my comfort zone? Cause that's sometimes easier. What did you say to yourself? Like, how did you get out of it? I think what it was, was going back to surfing. Um, like when you're out surfing and the waves are big and you're panic, you're just like, you're so scared and you're like, oh my God, what am I doing out here? And then all of a sudden you put yourself out there and you catch that first big wave and maybe you eat crap and you come up and you're like, oh, I didn't drown. Okay, I can do this. And then you get, you know, you build your confidence and build your confidence and build your confidence. And I think through surfing, I built so much confidence that I can do whatever I wanted that I was able to kind of break through that barrier and, and, and be confident that I can do it. That's a great analogy, too, because with surfing, I know I fall a lot, but mm -hmm. every time you fall, you get back up and you keep going again. Mm -hmm. And there's another wave then another wave. Um, and sometimes just to kind of piggyback off that analogy, I know that when the waves are really big, if you get too scared and you try to bail at the last second, you might end up in more trouble. Yeah. So you just have to just go commit. into the wave and completely commit. You have to commit. Yeah. And so and same way in life too. Yeah. You got to commit. So after college, you started your own um, firm agency uh, mm -hmm. for ads, right? And creative yeah. communications. Um, what Walk us through that early stages of you building your own business and where Volcom kind of came into the picture. Okay. So um, uh, right out of college, um, I my mom bought me a couple suits for to interview in and I thought I was wanted to be a graphic designer at an advertising agency. Um, went to ceremony on Thursday, was home that weekend, was out surfing Huntington, ran into a guy out in the water and he said, Hey, did you graduate? And I said, yes. And he goes, you need a job? And I'm like, yeah, what do you do? And he goes, well, I work at vision skateboards. And I go, Oh, whoa. And he's like, yeah, I'm the creative director and come work for me. I'm like, no, I'm going to work for an ad agency, you know? And I'm thinking, God, you know, skating was another passion of mine, skating pools and little parks growing up. And I'm just going, Oh, you know, he goes, just come by on Monday. So I show up on Monday and, um, 
and he, I go, so what do I do? And he goes, okay, you're going to, you're going to work on this, this skater's board. It's called, his name's Mark Gonzalez. And I'm like, the Gons? And I'm, he's like, yeah. And, he, and so I sat there and I had a technical pen and I was drawing the graphics and he was helping me out. And I'm like, this is exactly what I love to do. And awesome. so at the end of the day, he goes, well, what do you think? And I'm like, well, you know, what does it pay? And he goes, six fifty an hour. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm a college graduate. There's no way I need like 40 grand because all my other friends are making tons of dough. And how am I going to make six fifty an hour? And he goes, okay, well, that's just kind of how it is. And I'm like, and, but something inside of me was just going, this is what you love. It's your passion about it. Go for it. So started working for him uh, at Vision Skateboards uh, at six fifty an hour. And because I couldn't pay the bills, I started freelancing at night. And, um, my freelance business got so big, that's when, after two years of working at Vision, I left to start Macray Designs. And um, I started Macray Designs the day my son Colin was born. And so I had no job, a brand new baby, and a mortgage. And so when you so talk about- for success? <laughs> yeah. So when you, talk about, when you talk about being up against the wall, and I call it the cockroach mentality- you know, when you just got to chuck and jive and you're in the corner and some guy's trying to kick you and kill you and spray you and you just got to make things happen and, and stay alive. And so those things, those pressures, along with with my talents and my my grip of potential clients or clients I had at the time really helped me start Macro Designs. And I started uh, doing T-shirts and um, T-shirts, skateboard designs, decals. And um, and color separations for those mediums. Ah, awesome. So when you're, I love that when you're up against the wall, you know you got to kind of duck around and figure out, just find a way. Mm -hmm. um, basically, when your son was born, that's when you decided to start the new business. Was it at the same time? Um, it just coincidentally happened that way. Okay. I started. I, I was actually getting the my DBA for Macquarie Designs at the Daily Pilot. And I was working out of a, um, a neighbor's uh, praying shop. And uh, she knew I was going to Daily Pilot to, to get my DBA, to get my business going and what have you. And um, yeah, she called over to Daily Pilot and asked if Tom Macro is there. And they're like, he's filling out the papers right now. As you go to the hospital, his, you know, his wife's oh, in labor. So yeah, so that's kind of how it all started. And so total coincidence. Yeah. From that moment, I mean, that's, that's tough. I, I, I don't have kids yet. I know a lot of my, my friends, some good friends have kids and young ones, especially my cousins all have, you know, toddlers mm -hmm. are around and, and that can be really tough. That's a job within itself. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you manage, you know, having a brand new son and, and, and a brand new business, which is like mm -hmm. a baby too. Uh, it was, it was the most fun and the most scary time in my life. It was fun because here I am meeting with, great potential clients, clients meeting with Bob Hurley, who was running Billabong, Danny Kwok at Quicksilver, Charles Crow at Quicksilver. I had like all my friends that I surfed with or like Bob Hurley used to shape my surfboard. So that was my end with him. Wow. He was like a second dad. So it was like all of a sudden it was so fun because I was in their offices working and they were buying my designs and it was, it wasn't even work. It was like, it was I, like I said, I, I thought I was cheating and it was so much fun. So it, it that part was fun. Um, and then, you know, obviously, you know, being married and, and having a brand new baby and, and those stresses where you have to get home and, and help out and you're up all night. And, and, um, but everything was very understanding around my situation. And, um, and I had a great mentor to Paul Oxman. I was working out of his print shop. He actually gave me a loan for $3,000 and my mom bought me a, a, a copier from Price Club, um, which um, is Costco now. So, yeah, so just without that smaller investment, I built the company up to $30 million in, in billings. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. Um, you know, we talked about mentorship a little bit before this and just how important it is to have a good mentor. And you yourself are a mentor for college and high school kids, right? Yeah. Um, how do you think that it, also to not just mentorship, but, you know, 
it sounds like you meet everybody who you started doing business with mm -hmm. on the water, you know, mm -hmm. doing what you love um, and just having a good, strong group of people around you uh, and mentors. Uh, how do you think that's impacted your life through the years? Tremendously. Um, in the beginning, when anything would happen business wise, I would, you know, drive over to Bob Hurley's house and sit down with with him and Shelly and just go, oh, this is what's going on. Because my dad really didn't have that skill set. So I would always reach out to other people. Paul Oxman, this is what's going down. Okay, meet my banker, meet my lawyer. They gave me their um, Rolodex of people. So um, it, was, it was so great that I had that support mechanism around me mm -hmm. that were able to allow me to do whatever I want. And I had all the resources at my fingertips. And if they didn't have it, I was one of those guys that went out and got it. Absolutely. You just had to make it happen. And something interesting you said about uh, someone who you're mentoring right now, a high school kid, I think you said, school. right? Who just, what intrigued you about him was he stepped out of the box and reached out to you. Mm -hmm. And just for people who are listening to this, who go, wow, you know, you're so lucky. You had Bob Hurley who was helping you out and giving you all these resources. Uh, it's not, we always, if we look for it, we can find somebody in our life that can help us or can introduce us to someone who can help us. Um, and one thing that you said about that kid who reached out to you was that he just stepped out and asked you for some help. And mm -hmm. I found personally too with my mentors, and we were talking about this earlier, is just saying, hey, like, What's different about me? Am I special that they're just attracting me? Well, I'm working hard, which definitely attracts people. But at the same time, I go out there looking for someone and asking for help. And I think that's a big thing. So that people who feel like they don't have the right mentor, um, they can go find someone. They can go ask someone between mm -hmm. schools. I know schools have tons of mentorship programs like you do at mm -hmm. San Diego State and uh, high schools. And as well, there's a, a network called SCORE um, mm -hmm. where people can find a, a mentor for business or whatever that is in life. Um, mm -hmm. So I yeah. think it's amazing how, how you're doing that and kind of giving back to other kids yeah. now. It's, it's very important because I was that kid and I really didn't reach out to that many people because I thought I knew everything, mm. just like we all do. Of course. Um, but as I grew more mature, I knew I realized how important it was to reach out. And when you have a good mentor, model yourself after them. Mm -hmm. Really look at things that they do best and model yourself after those great things. And when you do that, you've, you, you have like this, I don't know, this belt of, of, of confidence or, or you just feel like you've, you, you know, you have that knowledge and you become more powerful. You know, they always say knowledge is power. And it really is true. I think uh, it's funny. I think that as well. I think you got to know the first strategy and seeing someone else do it. But you, the second thing you said would model what they do and do what they do. Mm -hmm. And that's always what we talk about is just how to take that knowledge and turn it into action. Mm -hmm. Because so many people know how to lose weight, but still don't do it. Yeah. Uh, know how to save money and still they're mm -hmm. in debt. And so that's, to me, the biggest thing that you started doing was you modeled their habits, their strategies, and, and mm -hmm. actually took that and and applied it to your life. Yeah. Um, so you're building a $30 million business. And at the same time, you're doing that, you know, you're doing that full time. And then in 1991, you start working with Volcom. Mm -hmm. And how did you balance building your own business and this business at the same time? Yeah. So the, how the whole Volcom um, brand started was that, um, Quicksilver in 1990 was m my biggest client. I, at that point, I was past just doing T-shirts, decals, skateboards, color separations. I was doing all their advertising. I was doing all their lookbooks, their, um, basically all their visuals. And um, I was working very closely with Danny Kwok, their marketing director, and Richard Wolcott, who was the assistant marketing director. And I happened that I surfed against both of them growing up. So they were really good friends. And, um, and we just had this great rapport. We did everything together. And um, there was a dip in the economy in 1990. Uh, Quicksilver brought in some, some people from outside the seed and it was kind of faltering and they were putting down some, some unrealistic goals on the guys. And, and, you know, at that point, Rich is just like, you know, I want to start something new. You know, I want to do a surf skate snow brand. 
And, um, and I'm like, well, you know, I'll do the logo and I'll do whatever that takes. And Danny's like, secretly, I would love to, you know, do his, he's a visionary. He's the ultimate visionary that I've ever met. Um, and so us three, we just kind of got together and, um, and, um, and that's kind of how it all started. And, you know, it started from absolutely nothing. Rich had a little office in his apartment. He just did a Sunkiss commercial. So he made like 10 grand. So that's why he quit Quicksilver. So he was living high and mighty back then. And, um, and he just, you know, became one of the best CEOs in action sports. He dedicated his whole life to build that company. And, um, and it was just, it was a, a amazing journey with these two and uh, uh, brought in a uh, rich's dad who brought in that senior vision uh he was one, one of the biggest heavy hitters on wall street in the 70s so he was managing a lot of money at the time and he just the great insights and he was just like moses you know just knew everything and he had his tablets and um but um yeah so um McElroy was here and vulcan was always close by if it wasn't in the built my same building, it was across the street or so physically, they physically, were very close. we yeah. were, yeah. we were, we were Bob's each win. So, um, I'd work eight hours at McElroy and then I'd work all night on Volcom stuff. And, um, and I was doing that probably, you know, five, six days a week. And, you know, along with having another child and a family and everything, it was just this, this shell game that was, crazy and so much fun and and taxing at the same time which um which was pretty amazing but uh yeah Vulcan we almost shut the doors probably five times in the first couple of years um I was just looking through some of the first financials and I was laughing going okay so we gave out ten thousand dollars and we did two thousand dollars worth of business we crushed it for this year <laughs> I mean we were ready to fold it up after that and that's when Rich's dad came in and, and some money injections and, and what have you. But um, yeah, by year three, we had traction, we had accounts, we were learning how to actually build clothes the right way. Um, but we did everything in a youth against establishment way. It was, and it's not going against the government or our schools or what have you. It was youth against establishment was just going against the common way of thinking. You know, everyone lives within this box and youth and establishment is just this, this pope for everyone to just get out of the box, think freely and, and do what you're passionate about. And, uh, and my partners were super passionate about it. And they, Tucker Hall was, was there from the very beginning as well. And he was the sales guy and he had charisma that you couldn't believe. So when the Vulcan party came into a new account with a 12 pack of beer and, just the whole gang, everyone was like, I want a part of this. And that was pretty much the campaign until, you know, years on. So, yeah. um, well, there's so much amazing information right there. So, I was just <laughs> 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 um, yeah. So you're starting off with, you've got eight hours and eight hours. You got two kids now. I want to just go over that a little bit real quick because so many younger kids who want success and want to build a business uh like i'm trying so hard you know and, oh really what do you do you know I put 30 hours of work in my job and you know on the weekends i i don't do anything they don't understand how much it takes in five six days a week 16 hour days mm -hmm. for five years before you really saw anything. And that's what it takes mm -hmm. uh, to go into, you said you almost closed the doors a couple, five times mm -hmm. even. What was one of the biggest obstacles you guys faced with Volcom and, and how did you guys overcome it? Uh, money, number one, uh, just having enough money to produce our orders because the stuff was getting so hot. We we're the number one brand. Everyone thought we were huge, but we were still basically one step out of a garage. Um, but the best thing was that we had Richard, who was, you know, Pepperdine graduate. We had an MBA as our CFO, Doug Collier. I mean, we were stacked and educated behind the veil, but we had every punk rock kid, kid crazy as team writers and, and ambassadors. 
Um, so we had the vibe, the marketing, the vibe was brilliant. What did you guys do? I mean, you said you were selling out like crazy. You were the number one brand. People thought you guys were so successful. How did you go from just an idea or a passion to, to build that brand? What did you guys do? Uh, we tapped into everything we were exposed to growing up. Um, uh, with Richard, he had grew up with Quicksilver and he was the assistant um, marketing manager. So he grew up stickering program. We had back in the day, there was not one light pole or electrical box in Orange County that didn't have a Volcom stone on. So you guys literally put stickers on everything. We one. stickered everything. I love that. That's awesome. <laughs> we would we had cruise and see cool kids, you know, around high schools and what have you and just go, hey, dude, hey, here's a box of clothes. Um, wear it and then whoever your coolest friends are, give them these stickers. And oh, by the way, here's a bunch of the big stickers and put them everywhere. So our biggest campaign was in the very beginning was a sticker program. And we had stickers everywhere and we couldn't afford trade shows. So we would sit outside of trade show shows with a U-Haul truck and sell out of a U-Haul truck until we could close down. Then we'd move to a, a hotel room and, and it was just this weird, this mysterious anarchy machine that everyone wanted to be a part of, but we were so elusive that no one really knew what was going on. You were so elusive because you couldn't afford to get in the trade show. Exactly. <laughs> we couldn't afford to get in there and sell. So we had to like, you know, have the U-Haul. Man, I love the hustle. The uh, hustle. Yeah. Gutter. It was gutter marketing. Absolutely. From the gutter up. And people get so <clears throat> preoccupied with social media advertising now because it's so easy, mm -hmm. right? They just click a button, I hire somebody, and then they just they run ads. And people are overwhelmed with the stimulus. I love how you guys were, you're doing this well before social media was mm -hmm. around. But I almost feel people need to bring that same attitude back where you're walking up to people and talking to them. Hey, man, this is what you got to go to this. Going to like actually meet these people in person and then just the physical advertisements of putting stickers everywhere. Fantastic. Yeah. Super yeah. cool. In regards to uh, finding intelligence on what kids were into uh, with my agency, I always subscribe to research. But by the time the research was gathered reported and got to me, it was already old. I mean, I'm in youth marketing, the most fickle, fickle market in the world. It is kids change week to week, what have oh, you. Yeah. So what I, what we would do is I would have people that would go to concerts and events and not pass out flyers, but just go up and go, Hey bro, what's up? Well, yeah. So why are you wearing Vans? So why are you rocking Dickies? Oh, cool. That's a cool shirt. Like, where'd you get that? And is it mind if we take a Polaroid of you? Okay, cool. You know, here's whatever, sticker or whatever. Hey, thanks, you know. And we would have all these street teams across the nation, and that's how we got our information. And we got it so that we knew what was going on that weekend rather than what happened three to six months prior. So that's how we were always, that's how McElroy was always ahead of everyone else because we had the best intelligence. We went out there and hired the coolest kids to gather it. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, that was pushed right into at the board meetings of Volcom. Hey, yeah. this is what's going on, da, da, da. You know, sit with the designers, um, Neil Harrison. Hey, the, you know, what about this? This is some polar, you know, just kind of influence on that side. Um, so, yeah, it was all about intelligence and knowing what the kid was wearing. And, you know, I would look for that one kid that was on the tip tip of the pyramid who kind of runs the program who everyone looks up to and just go okay what is he wearing yeah people what, what music is he listening to how did you find a guy like that because i mean there are people like that too who when they do one thing and suddenly all everybody listens to you know, you had teams of people out there how'd you recruit them it was easy because they wanted to be a part of a volcom and rich did an incredible job and 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 Troy Eckert and, and those guys, they, they knew how to get those best guys. They knew how to get the, they weren't the best team riders other than like a Terrier, um, who was the best nowhere in the world. But we always got the coolest kid to wear and surf or skate or, or, or ride for us. You know, it was always, we, everyone gravitated to us. You know, yeah. Kelly Slater was wearing our stuff when he was, with, you know, with Quicksilver and he wore it because, you know, he's good friends with all of us and, and Rich and Danny and whatever, but it was like, 
Like he wanted to wear it because it was cool. Because yeah. back then, Quick was super conservative, and and here was Vulcan. It was just everything. Was That's punk incredible. Rock and yeah. Um, I don't know if you ever read the book called The Tipping Point. Yep. Yeah. Read it. Fantastic book. Mm-hmm. Um, but it talks about those, uh, the shoes, the Crocs Mm -hmm. and how you get a few influential people who start to wear them and all of a sudden something that just doesn't even seem popular at all now comes in waves and just thousands and thousands of people start subscribing to it. That's exactly what it sounds like you guys did. Mm -hmm. You managed to hit the key influencers to get to a tipping point where all of a sudden, boom, you were off to the races. Uh, so amazing. Yeah. Yeah, And we started... Um, our demographic in the very beginning was like eight to 14. We wanted the kids. We knew if we planted the seed with these kids and they became disciples, they were going to wear our stuff forever. Yeah. And it's true. There's guys that are still from day Guilty. one, <laughs> from day one, you know, a couple of them work for other companies right now, but, but they, to this day, you've just talked about Volcom. They're just like, you know, it was something that, that they had growing up and they still love the brand and, and, you know, still wear it if they can. If a couple of guys work for other bigger uh, other yeah, brands or yeah, yeah. other brands and they yeah. can't wear it, but they still love the brand. And, but uh, it was like getting them young, planting the seed, nurturing them. It's just like it growing a plant. And so what really attracted everybody to your guys' brand was this pursue your passion, think outside the box, youth against establishment, what was going on at the time where people were paint us the picture of what everybody else kind of looked like and how you guys just were that out of the box. And that's what started to attract everybody over to you, your uniqueness. Yeah. Um, early nineties, mid nineties, everyone was super conservative, preppy surfing was getting, it was just getting so dull. Uh, snowboarding on the other hand had this just anarchy vibe skiing was going out because it was lame and the ski nobody changed the two planks they were the same planks snowboarding came in and just changed it was easy people in the learning curve was faster plus you just had this attitude of when you strapped into a snowboard you were like an anarchist and with that came the fashion and you know in the very beginning had these big old wide denim pants and um jeans and a t-shirt and a sweatshirt it could be snowing in one you know five degrees below zero and you're only in a sweatshirt and in in oversized jeans and it was like you're freezing but you're cool and that (laughs) cool factor got you through the freezingness of it all um but yeah we tapped into snowboarding uh and that vibe and 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 we were always able to whatever sport was kind of leading fashion and image wise we were able to kind of put that out as a forerunner. Yeah. And at, at, there's been instances where nobody knew what Vulcan was. Was it a surf brand? Was it a snowboard brand? Was it a skate brand? Is it a music label? What is it? It's a lifestyle. Bingo. And once you become a lifestyle, it doesn't, it doesn't matter uh, if you are clothing, music, surfing, skating, snowboarding, whatever, your lifestyle and people want to be a part of it. So whatever you put out, people will buy it. That's amazing. Incredible how you create that. I'm curious to know when you were starting out, how did you define success? What did it mean to be successful for you? For me, it was being able to do everything I want to do and be able to pay my bills and make money. And I learned on, I learned at Vision Skateboards that you can get rich working for somebody, but you'll never be wealthy. Mm-hmm. And Paul Oxman taught me that too. He goes, Tom, you want to be wealthy. And money, I didn't even care about money ever. It was just whatever. And the more I didn't care about it, the more I made. And the more I made, I didn't care about it. And people wanted to pay me even more. It was just weird dynamic that happened. And so, I don't know. It just, I wanted to live the lifestyle. I wanted to do the things I wanted to do. I wanted to have a good family life. I wanted wanted the full Monty And it just, and be passionate about what I did. I mean, I'd show up at work every day and go, are you kidding me? I get paid for this. So cool. I gotta tell you, especially nowadays, a lot of people that I talk to, um, the ones that struggle, you know, with the, with the job that they took for money, (laughs) not for love. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then you've got people who say, well, 
you know, and I've struggled with that too. Mm-hmm. Don't get me wrong. I've mm-hmm. really struggled mm-hmm. with it at times. And I find that some people say, well, you can't just pursue your passion because, you know, your passion doesn't make money. You got to pay the bills first. Mm-hmm. So you find something that kind of pays the bills. It's just so hard to make sure you're passionate. What do you tell kids right now that right out of college or in college that are want to pursue something like art, which my dad probably would have left. I actually did acting for a while and he kind of had a similar conversation <laughs> with me. You're not going to be a dentist. What do you mean? You know? yeah. And, uh, And so what do you tell kids when they want to pursue that passion and they're concerned about just surviving? Because that's a really big deal Mm -hmm. with student loan debt and, and, you know, Mm -hmm. high, uh, the economy is so difficult. It's harder to get a job. You're not getting paid well. What do you tell? Uh, Great question. And it's probably one of the biggest issues that a graduate goes through right now. Um, There's some kids that come right out of the gate. They can become entrepreneurs because they started something in college and, and they have that set of skills and they're on the, on, that's a very, 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 very small percentage of of kids. Other kids, what I tell them is find something that you, you like and that you can learn from. What are you going to learn from? You want to work for a company that you're going to learn something from, you're going to excel and it's going to build your resume and build you as a business person. You need those get those that skill set, um, and then always. But if you have your passion, have that eye on on the on that target. Have that that nugget out there that if time comes and when time does come, if you truly want to be an entrepreneur, you need to reach out and, and go for it. There's going to be a time when your passion, your risk level your your confidence in yourself will all come together and you're surrounded around good people that's when you jump ship and you start something yeah not everyone it's not for everybody so the kids you can tell kids that are very complacent with where they're at and you just say become an entrepreneur within the company i like that yeah become that entrepreneur if you need to be comfortable within a company and i have one of my dearest friends is that guy He is the best company guy in the world, but once he works for a company, he's an entrepreneur within and he kicks ass. Just just to explain it for everybody, being an entrepreneur in the company, you mean being that go-getter, that leader, but still in the security net of working for that company. Exactly. Exactly. Just kind of pushing things and not doing it in a way that's offensive, but do it in a way that you're enrolling people on your vision and where you want to go in in a way that is positive. Yeah. Because... No one's going to follow you if you're a, a kook. Yeah. I but if it. you are positive, people will follow you. And it's, it's, it's pretty simple. I, I laugh because I, I think sometimes uh, some people think I'm crazy, you know, just with like as my vision kind of grows and grows and grows. And they go, how would you possibly do that? But I also think that passion comes into play, right? Mm-hmm. When you're so passionate about something, you're able to find a way, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and no matter what happens, no matter what obstacle you hit, no matter how many times you quote unquote fail, it's never a failure. You're learning, you're growing, you're, Mm -hmm. you're figuring out how to get to what you want. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to another question for you during those five years, as you're growing both of your businesses, how did you stay focused? What did you do when things did get tough? Um, I went to my roots which was family and surfing. It's amazing when you sit on your board and you look out at the horizon, life gets super clear. So I, I look at surfing as my therapist and the family mechanism was there. It was solid, it was comfortable and, and it was user-friendly. So um, I had that as well. So I had that and then I had the wealth of friendships and business partners that I worked with that were like my extended family. So I had this just giant group of just everything that made it very comfortable for me. So you had a great network. And then also to you surf every day, Mm -hmm. right? And so I think that everybody's got something out there. Yours is surfing, which surfing, you're right. You know, sometimes you can be sitting on the water and there's just that clarity. It's about being in mother nature. Plus it also... 
it really calms it down because it's mm-hmm. so powerful mm-hmm. um, and beautiful all at the same time. And I, I feel that a lot in different sports and everything that I do sometimes with uh, physical exertion mm-hmm. is a meditative state yep. to clear yourself and clear your mind. And I think that's an important daily habit, daily yep. practice that you have that I also love. I think it's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Meditation, yoga, just anything where it's you're pushing that exertion, getting the endorphins firing, you have your adrenaline, you're out of you're out of the office. I, you know, I would make everyone leave the office at lunch to go surfing or swim, whatever you were into. At lunch, you would make everybody Oh, it was like, no, you're not eating in the office. No, we'll get out of here. Or if they weren't doing it, I would basically go find out what they were into and go do it with them. That's awesome. You know, just let's just get out of here. Yeah. Because when everyone would come back at one o'clock, everyone was super stoked. And I would tell clients. All new clients, I go, by the way, you cannot contact me in between 1130 to one because I'm gone and I don't do martini lunches. I'm surfing or I'm swimming. I'm doing something. And people are like, well, you can't do that. I'm like, (laughs) yes, I can. Look at this smile. That's awesome. (laughs) I think everybody's got to find something that breaks out of the way. And you said get out of the office. And in my head, I was like, oh, not just out of the office, but out of my head, Mm -hmm. too. Because every problem we have always spirals out of control in our head. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to get out of the office, but out of our head. And those kind of activities really help do that. Exactly. Super cool. Um, One of the other things that I I love and, you know, looking at your books here in your studio, talking about logos. You you were the artist behind one of the most iconic logos, uh, definitely of my generation. And... Really, I mean, for worldwide in this entire skate, snow, surf brand lifestyle. How did you design this? Where was your inspiration? You talk a lot about how you do so much in-depth research. Can you go into that process for us? Yeah. So uh, originally the the company was Stone Boardware. And um, with that, you know, okay, Stone, what is it? It's a piece of earth. It's it's something that, that Mother Nature created so what I did was, I, you know, I Greek mythology, went through that, went through everything that related to earth, wind and fire. Um, and then from there, I went, I loved geology in, um, in college. I always took geology classes. So I went to geology, went through numerous, ge- you know, geological books. Um, and I got this one pamphlet. It was about the earth and different structures and what have you. And it was just built from 1940. It's just this little black and white pamphlet that uh, I think my brother picked up. My, my youngest brother was my, um, my runner. He would run to the library and get, this was before the computer. So you just yeah. couldn't Google something and it would just load. So we, I actually had to go to the library and research and get imagery for what I was doing. So he, so I got the book and this, you know, I'm looking through the pamphlet and I got to this one chapter. It said the diamond, the most precious stone. And I'm like, whoa, that has a really cool ring to it. Open it up. Second page, there's a diagram of a diamond cut in half. And the soul of that diamond, it was a line drawing. And I went, that's really cool. And so I sketched it and it was still like the, like, the diamond logo. Now that's been that ripped off the Vulcan logo. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, guys. Um, so I, you know, I first drew it that way on a tissue, and back then everything was positive negative, because I just felt the yin and the yang was just so important in everyone's life, and and it, that was just kind of how I was the thinking at the time. You know, life. black and white, black yeah, and white, yeah. black and white. No gray area. You commit. You got to just make it happen. Um, so, you know, I sketched it and then I did my little positive negative deal on it. And I remember drawing it and it was really squatty and, and I'm like, yeah, it looks pretty cool. And I remember showing it to, to Rich and Danny and they're just like, yeah, looking, you know, things are good. And, and I remember, and I think, I don't know how the process was of just turning it upside down where it looked like you can, like a, like a thorn on a rose, um, a branch. And I'm like, Oh, it looks like you, you can prick yourself. And then from there, it was just like, okay, condense it, 
and, and bring it in more so it looks a little more aggressive and tighten up all the you know positive negatives and 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 really make that soul of the diamond come out and so basically the Volcom stone is a soul of a diamond the most precious stone that's beautiful i i love the uh, the depth that you go into with your research and for that logo and creating the soul of the diamond mm. um that's pretty cool and it, it's clear to me that you're, the passion that you had when you started that, it's just as clear today. Yeah. Uh, and I love that because I really think that the passion is the energy. You know, mm -hmm. it was how to stay motivated in some of those tough times that we, like we were talking about when you're really struggling. Um, and if you're passionate about what you do, you're going to pursue it for extended periods of time. Um, I think that's, I think that's really great. I was just thinking about um, some of the strategies really that people do new entrepreneurs. So, you know, kids who are struggling to get out of, out of a job in entrepreneurship, but the entrepreneurs that are really already starting to run the business, mm -hmm. um, with, with growing two business you have, and 30 million and 600 million later on down the line, you've been able to create this amazing lifestyle. What kind of strategies would you recommend for young entrepreneurs to become more successful more quickly too, mm -hmm. um, to be able to grow their business as fast as possible. Yeah. Well, I think the first thing to do is it's great to do a business plan and what have you, but once that business plan last period inked on it, it's obsolete because the world's already changed. So basically you need to get out there and know your market and, and push the limits and, and not worry about funding and all this other crap, just make it, I mean, if you need to bootstrap it, whatever you need to do, use business card, I mean, credit cards, whatever it takes to get product or service into the market, you do it immediately. And then you can do all the research and, and build your, 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 your network around you, your support mechanism to get it to the next level. I know so many people that have wasted so much time trying to get funding for, for projects. And the, the, it was a great idea two years ago, but they haven't got their money yet and they're still fumbling. I think what it is, is you immerse yourself. There's no failure. You, if you believe in your concept and if, you did, if you've done the research to know that the market needs that product or service, then you just need to make it happen. And and you need to go out and, and research how to better yourself within the market, know your competition, how to be ahead of them, uh, and also learn how to run your company better mm -hmm. and, and not waste because there's so many people that start companies and they get a, a windfall of money and they're like, oh, my God, you know, big salaries and everything. And then year two, you're out of money and the thing's gone. Great idea, but mismanaged. I saw a list of the top 10 funded companies of 2017 that failed and are gone. And at the top of that list, this one blows me away, Juicero, which was a machine that could squeeze the juice back at fresh juice, received like 120 to $140 million in funding. And then on the internet, they found out they could buy the juice packet without buying the $700 machine and just squeeze it with their hand. Mm. And it was just as good. And then the companies pretty much folding. I mean, they're like selling cheaper products, but mm. it was one of the biggest failures. And I think, you know, doing the research, like you said, but not necessarily looking for the next round of funding, but mm. how are you going to create a, a viable business mm -hmm. that makes money? And another thing you said too was action, right? You got to get out there and do it. And I really believe in the 80-20 rule, which mm. is, uh, you know, 80% of our results come from 20% of our actions, but we got to know which actions to take. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't taken any action, you absolutely need to take some action, of course. Mm -hmm. um, for for somebody who is struggling with just the entrepreneurship journey, um, getting out there, what's one action we could take today that would be definitely stepping forward in the right direction? Uh, I would reach out to that whatever space you're in um, and reach out in research or reach out in somebody who's involved in it, who works for a company or a competitor or somebody that you can learn from, you can model from that could give you a little edge to have a better product and, and don't spend so much time um, 
building the, well, it, not building the product, but just getting something out there to get feedback. Mm -hmm. You know, time is of essence. Um, but I think basically reaching out and, and, you know, finding that right person that could help you or the right seminar or just something that out there that can educate you to get you to the next. It's amazing. I think the theme of mentorship is kind of been filtered into our conversations almost, you know, it's just coming up again and again and again. And just, it shows how powerful it is to find somebody who's done what you want to do, learn from them. So you can almost condense time, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they take a lifetime of experience and you can learn it in a couple hours or a couple days or over mm -hmm. the course of a few months, if you're, you know, being mentored by them and almost skip ahead mm -hmm. and not make their same mistakes. And then another thing too, is getting something to to product or to the the customer in a way mm -hmm. where you're actually starting to make money so you can get a result you can get feedback mm -hmm. uh, recently i've just talked to a few people that you know are starting something new working on something i myself have worked on things for a year and then you know by the time you get to be done it's mm -hmm. not exactly what you thought and mm -hmm. you didn't do enough research or it didn't work out the way you thought it was going to work out uh, and one thing now that i do is I just try to get 80 to 85% of the way there. I don't want to be perfect anymore. Um, somewhere along the line, I thought I had to be perfect. And I'm, you know what? I don't want to do that. To me, it's like a, an exam in school or, you know, getting ready for a sports game. You just got to go out there and do it. You prepare yep. as best you can, mm -hmm. but eventually you got to do it so you can see what the results are. Mm -hmm. uh, and that also brings up another thing you kind of talked about or hinted at. How do you define failure? Because it doesn't seem you're, like you fail, but you know sometimes people define failure as an endpoint. What is it to you? Uh, I think failure is a as a beginning point because you've just had a harsh, re, harsh lesson of reality, and you can react in a positive way or a negative way. Um, there's been so many instances where you know. If you know it's not your core business and you failed, you can just go, okay, I'm done. Or if it's your core business and you failed, you need to learn immediately how to make it happen. How do you change your business model? How do you change um, the way of thinking with your employees? I mean, you have to commit to change right then and there. Um, but for me, failure has always been something where it's like a, a wildfire that came in and burned everything down. And then all of a sudden the new plant grows and something new comes up that wasn't even on the radar. Mm. So, and I've been there. I've walked away from businesses that I thought I was, was going to be my core business, lost big time. And there's other ones where it was within my core business. I failed and I learned how to do it down the road better. Yeah, that's it's interesting. You know, a lot of parallels in our life a little bit. I mean, there's been things that I've tried and failed at. Other things that have you know always been my core business, where you know, I even failed in there and had to learn from it. Uh, and I think that's important as especially the younger generation goes out. As sometimes people say, "Well, I don't know what I want to do for the rest of my life," and I'm like, "You don't have to make that decision now necessarily, mm -hmm. but you've got to try." different things. You've got to really push and really commit to it though as well. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you crash and burn, mm -hmm. but out of that burn, you, something new develops and whatever you learn from that in the past, it leads into to creating something bigger and better for you mm -hmm. down the line. Um, absolutely. I think that's uh, absolutely incredible. And mm -hmm. just, uh, if there's anything else to for, for entrepreneurs that maybe you have some piece of advice or something that you tell your kids as they're going into business. I would say chase your passion, take risk, surround yourself with good people and believe in yourself. And I think with those four things, they create luck. And if you enroll and, and, and subscribe to those four things, you're going to become lucky and you're going to be, your luck will become better and better. And uh, that's one thing that, that people have talked to me about over the years. They're like, oh, Macro, you're so lucky. And I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, well, everything just happened for you. And I'm like, bullshit. I've took amazing risk. I've, I've leveraged everything. 
but I was super passionate about what I was doing and I believed in myself and I had a network of really good people. Hell, things, of course I'm lucky. Success, right? And of course. And I always say, you know, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Mm -hmm. And if you take enough action, eventually you're going to get lucky, right? Yep. Uh, I, I love those four steps. I think that's 100% true. Um, and just to wrap this up, uh, if anybody wanted to reach out to you, if social media, we can reach out. How do uh, you do? Instagram, Tom McRoy, T H O M M C E L R O I, and Facebook, Tom McRoy. And, uh, you know, I always believe that there's a, a next level of success that everybody's always growing to. As, as we become better, I mean, you've mm -hmm. you retired, you know, easily with these companies as you've grown them. Uh, but there's always a next level of success in different areas of life. So for you, what are you doing now and what's your next level of success? My, my level of success and will be is helping kids get to the next level um, at high school level, in college level, uh, as a mentor, um, helping out uh, San Diego State. I sit on the board there, I'm, I uh, chair a department um, it's just, I want to help out kids and, um, and I'll do whatever it takes to, to, for that to happen. And so that is my ultimate task right now is just to help the school out, help the kids out just so it, they become success and, and, and just better people. I gotta tell you, I think that, um, I'm sure they know it and if they don't just say it, but. They're all very lucky to have someone like you who's willing to donate their time and energy and focus to be able to help them become more successful because we need more people like you to be able to teach the young kids and, and help them grow into the great human beings as well. So um, thank you very much for coming on Unleash Success. It was a great time. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot, man. If you guys enjoyed the show and learned something of value, the one ask that we have is please go subscribe. 